Welcome to Black Lives. Okay, now, you're good to go. Welcome to Black Lives, Black Lungs. I am Dr. Yolanda Savoy, project lead of the Coppin Against Vaping and Tobacco Initiative. And I am here tonight with Dr. Arian Tatum, project lead of the Coppin Against Vaping and Tobacco Initiative. We will be sharing a documentary tonight that will invoke a powerful discussion. The author of this documentary is named Lincoln Mundy, and he's from Farmville, Texas. Home is biracial, and he noticed something strange about smokers in his family. His father and the other Black smokers almost exclusively smoke menthol cigarettes, while his white mother and her relatives who smoke only use non-menthol products. Years later, while interning with Truth Initiative in college, the author Lincoln Mundy learned that his family's smoking behaviors was no coincidence. Menthol cigarettes, which are easier to smoke and harder to quit, have been strategically marketed to appeal to African-American community for decades. And today, nearly 90% of all African-American smokers use menthol cigarettes. And 47,000 African-Americans die from smoking-related diseases each year. This realization inspired Monday to participate in the 2015-2016 Truth Initiative Youth Activism Fellowship and create this documentary that you will see tonight called Black Lives, Black Lungs. This documentary explores the history, the marketing tactics, and impact of the tobacco industry targeting African Americans with menthol tobacco products. He said this project, which also features experts, activists across the country, is part of his efforts to turn his anger into action and inspire viewers to do the same. After the film, he wants to motivate you and he also wants you to get angry. He wants you to go out and he wants you to do something and be an advocate. Tell your friends, tell everybody, get involved. That kind of spiral effect, I think, will start the drumbeat of what needs to happen in this country in framing tobacco control as a social justice issue. African Americans and tobacco use. We want to give you a little bit of facts before we show the documentary. Tobacco use is a major contributor to the three leading causes of death among African Americans, heart disease, cancer, and stroke. We're number five here for um, smoking and lung disease from that. We're number five according to the Baltimore statistics and the CDC. African American children and adults are more likely to be exposed to secondhand smoke than any other racial or ethnic group. And most African American adult cigarette smokers want to quit smoking, and many have tried. The targeted marketing. The tobacco industry has aggressively marketed menthol products to young people and African Americans, especially in urban communities. Tobacco companies have historically placed larger amounts of advertising in African American publications, exposing African Americans to more cigarette ads than whites. And historically, the marketing and promotion of menthol cigarettes have been targeted heavily toward African Americans through culturally tailored advertising images and messages. Over seven out of 10 African American youth ages 12 to 17 years old smoke using menthol cigarettes. African American adults have the highest percentage of menthol cigarettes used compared to other racial and ethnic groups. Menthol in cigarettes is thought to make harmful chemicals more easily absorbed into the body, likely because menthol makes it easier to inhale cigarette smoke. And there has been research that shows menthol cigarettes may be more addictive and non-menthol cigarettes. All right, let's look at pricing, promotion, and retail and point of sale advertising. Tobacco companies use price promotions such as discounts and multi-pack coupons to increase the sales. 
Um, areas with large racial and ethnic minority populations tend to have more tobacco retailers located within them, which contributes to a greater tobacco advertising exposure. And menthol products are given more shelf space in these retail outlets within African American communities and other minority neighborhoods. So here we are, we're about to show you our documentary by Lincoln Monday, Black Lives, Black Lungs. Dr. Tatum, we don't have audio. We don't? No. Okay, I'm sorry. I guess I got to stop presenting. Uh -oh. What do I stop presenting? And just make sure that slider is on. Okay, it was on the first time. Okay, sorry about that. We'll try that again. Three years ago, I accepted an internship with Truth Initiative. At the time, I thought I knew everything I needed to know about tobacco. Yes, it could be deadly, but my generation was rejecting it in much larger numbers. But what I knew was just the beginning. Today, tobacco-related diseases are still the number one cause of death in the African-American community. And that's not a coincidence. During my time with Truth Initiative, I read dozens of research articles and stacks of internal documents directly from tobacco industry files. I learned that the tobacco industry strategically and successfully infiltrated my community. And while it's true that they targeted many groups, the targeting of the black community has been uniquely damaging. Critics charge that the tobacco companies view black smokers as a growing source of income. In fact, they say, blacks are the target of carefully plotted and highly specific marketing campaigns. For decades, the tobacco companies have used predatory practices aimed to push their deadly product onto the black community. Practices that contribute to the approximately 45,000 black people who will die every year from tobacco-related diseases. This film, Black Lives, Black Lungs, is part of my effort to turn my anger into action. I've set out to give voice to some of the experts and activists who have spent their lives taking on the tobacco industry. Because understanding the history of this 50 year plus campaign is critical for taking back the health of our community. In high school, I became involved in tobacco control because my uncle passed away um, from tobacco related diseases. And I remember him telling me uh, when I was younger that when he first started, it was because the industry told him it would cure his asthma. And if you were to hear that statement today, you would think that's the most ludicrous thing you've ever heard. And I just felt like it was so unfair for an industry to be able to target someone like my uncle and have him die as a result. If he had known the real health effects from the get-go, he would have never picked it up. I lost my uncle to an industry who does not care about him, who does not care about the Black body. And I feel I have a responsibility to speak out against it. Addiction is about, it's about brain chemistry and it's about access. It's not about personal weakness. It's not about uh, poor black people just are gonna do something anyway. It's about that you give this entity access to, your, to the brains of your children, of your people, and they become addicted. There's nothing inherently black about menthol cigarettes. They were invented in 1925 by Lloyd Spud Hughes. Spud created his own brand, Spud Brand, which were the first widely sold menthol cigarettes in the United States. In 1932, Brown and Williamson Tobacco launched its own menthol brand, Cool. And in 1956, industry behemoth R.J. Reynolds introduced Salem, the first menthol cigarette with the filter tip. R.J. Reynolds marketed Salem as fresher, cool, and refreshing. Of course, all without any scientific proof. Salem's special paper breathes in fresh air with every puff. 
the death rates for African Americans who smoke uh, hover around 49,000 per year. It's no accident that African Americans smoke more menthol cigarettes. One of the greatest marketing coups that took place in the 20th century is transforming menthol cigarette to a black cigarette. The African Americanization of menthol cigarettes in the United States starts with finding a specialty product for African Americans following World War II. Many African Americans had moved to the North. There were specialty products being developed for them, certain hair creams, certain foodstuffs, and the tobacco industry, particularly some of them, began to realize we could market a particular brand to this group of people. Brown and Williamson conducted a number of focus groups in the late 50s and early 60s that identified that African Americans were more receptive to TV commercials, more receptive to the messages that are provided there. Brown and Williamson then took 90% of their budget and put it into television advertising because they knew African Americans would disproportionately look at that. They began to use black images um, on television and in their ads. In 1953, 5% of African Americans used menthol products compared to 3% for whites. By 1968, that had tripled to 14%. By 1976, it had tripled again to over 42% into the 2000s, we're above 80%. That's the African-Americanization of menthol cigarettes in the United States. It's the targeted marketing over now, over a half a century toward black folks. Let's dig in a little bit deeper and talk about how African-Americans are disproportionately burdened by death and disease from tobacco, cigars, and cigarillos. Um, when it comes to understanding it as a public health issue, I didn't know about that or a social justice issue in particular until I started working with TRDRP and Truth Initiative. I didn't understand that the industry had been targeting my community. In the middle of Jim Crow, there's a civil rights battle going on and the tobacco industry is way past that. They've already, they've got um, Elston Howard captured from the New York Yankees, black man selling cool cigarettes. They have executives in their offices in North Carolina that they're, you know, promoting while black folks can't even get a job or sit at a lunch counter. So they're way ahead of the curve. In 1971, the Public Health Cigarette Smoking Act banned the advertising of cigarettes on TV and radio. The tobacco industry was one of the first industries to recognize and not all marketing needs to go toward white males. So it was good to see Black people in the ads and to see that there were Black models and that it wasn't all drugs and gangs. And so it was hard. You know, people saw that and they were very much attracted to that. For decades, the tobacco industry has infiltrated the Black community, infiltrated Black institutions. In return, what the Black community got was death and disease. We know the facts. We have the scientific knowledge that tells us that we die in larger numbers. If people stop smoking, if people um, resisted using these products, it's a preventable disease. We wouldn't have to die in such large numbers. Why do some things still happen in society that we know are wrong? It's all tied to money. Why is the tobacco industry able to sell a product that will definitely, undoubtedly kill you? because there's money tied to it. And money makes things happen. I found myself very touched and even upset over what I was seeing because I saw lists of organizations that included organizations that I grew up in, organizations that I was currently a member of, and I had no idea that behind the scenes there were negotiations between the leaders of these organizations and tobacco companies where they were accepting money and sponsorships. So in the summer of 1984, I was in my preventive medicine residency at Johns Hopkins. I was doing internships around the country. And so one of the organizations I did an internship was with the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. While I was there, I was very concerned about the relationship between the CBCF and the tobacco industry. So I started talking to other interns um, who were there and then also my supervisors to sort of see, you know, what can be done? Is it possible to do something from the inside? Because I knew that the effect that it was having on African-Americans in, in general. 
And so what they suggested was that I write a memo to the executive director. So the memorandum reads, I am very much disturbed by the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation's policy of promoting cigarette smoking. I am especially disturbed at the free distribution of cigarettes at CBCF functions. I am requesting that you raise these issues at the CBCF policy board in the hope that we will adopt a policy more in line with our interest in the well-being of Black Americans. And that's how it begins. Unfortunately, somewhere in the neighborhood of 90% of all African-American civil, religious, political, um, social organizations take money from the tobacco industry. That's just because we ain't got no money. They're buying, you know, they're buying the silence of these people. The Congressional Black Caucus is a multi-million dollar foundation. And uh, last time I looked, at least half of their members take money from the tobacco industry. Now, not all of them do. And we tried to work, of course, with the ones that don't, like Karen Bass from Los Angeles and Barbara Lee from up here, Alma Adams in North Carolina. But it's a hard sell and it's still a hard push to get groups to speak up against the tobacco industry. The tobacco industry has a very interesting and highly complex relationship with African Americans. Yes, the tobacco industry was the first, or among the first industries to give African Americans high level executive jobs. They fund several black scholarships, including the Thurgood Marshall Fund. They funded a major civil rights organization, including the NAACP, the National Urban League, the Congress of Racial Equality, and much more. They did give people in the entertainment industry their first leg up. But you can give me everything in the world. But at the end of the day, what is this industry doing? 47,000 African-Americans a year die as a result of tobacco-related diseases. That is the leading cause of death in the African-American community. There's not enough shiny trinkets in the world that you can give me in exchange for my life. There's not enough shiny trinkets in the world that you could give me in exchange for my brother's life, for my sister's life. It doesn't matter how much money you pump into the community. We are worth so much more. In my experience, people have been shocked to learn that, you know, they fund so much that their dollars reach so far. But I think that it needs to be known. I'm sitting at my desk one day in 1998 when the Surgeon General's report comes out, first report on racial and ethnic minorities and smoking, and it just kind of slapped me in the face that African Americans were dying disproportionately of tobacco-related diseases across the board. I was actually one of the first to start looking at what the industry had written in their own words about their plans to market their products to African-American communities and looking at their relationship building with African-American organizations and organizations that I was currently a member of and I had no idea that behind the scenes there were negotiations between the leaders of these organizations and tobacco companies where they were accepting money and sponsorships tobacco-related diseases was really, I saw a main cause for the health disparities that were affecting my community. I couldn't turn my back on this. I just couldn't. And one of my colleagues um, actually saw me crying at my desk at UC San Francisco because I was just so, um, so upset over what I was seeing. And she asked a question, I wonder if others in your community would have this kind of reaction to these documents. We then got funding to do another project where we took the documents to groups of African-American smokers and young people, elderly people in the community to find out if they would have a similar reaction. And it was very clear that this was information that they didn't have, that they wanted it, that they wished that they had had prior to them picking up a cigarette. I work with the group, the African American Tobacco Control Leadership Council. Our tagline is saving black lives, and that at bottom it is a social justice question. You might look at it this way, when you have the tobacco industry targeting of African Americans, disproportionately advertising in our communities, giving away free samples, menthol products are less expensive in the African American community. It's a classic definition 
of a social justice issue where there is a major player taking advantage of a lesser person. Now, there has been some changes. The National NAACP passed a resolution at the July convention saying that chapters could support local and state resolutions to curb or regulate menthol. This is a major breakthrough. Yeah, the legislation I'm signing today represents change that's been decades in the making. Today, thanks to the work of Democrats and Republicans, health care and consumer advocates, the decades-long effort to protect our children from the harmful effects of tobacco has emerged victorious. Today, change has come. It's always been an uphill battle. Look at the black folks who fought to set up the Underground Railroad. Look at the black folks who fought Jim Crow. If we're going to fight this, then you're in it for the long haul. Our communities are under great stress, so we need healthier lifestyles, but we don't need people dumping this poison in our neighborhoods. If you know someone who smokes who's black, they probably smoke menthol cigarettes. Tell their story. I think when it comes to just living as an African-American, understanding that just because of who we are, our lives are constantly at threat, whether it is racial injustice, police brutality, being denied access to things. All of these issues are layered and connected. I made a decision at, at 18 that I was going to fight back, and I am 67. I continue that fight. Black Lives Matter, hands up, don't shoot. I can't breathe. I think we're all answering the same question. What is the worth of a Black body in the United States of America? Okay. Wow. That is, um, it's dark, you know? Yeah, it is. When you, um, when you look at the calculated, um, attack on, um, Black lives, and the last statement that the young lady made, she said, you know, Black life is constantly in jeopardy. She said it's, it's under attack whether it's, you know, through the the um, smoking of menthol cigarettes or whether it's police brutality or, you know, chronic diseases and things like that. It is just um, amazing that we still keep on moving. So let's talk let's talk about um, what we have, what we have um, viewed. And I'm sorry, I can't see um, any faces or anything. <laughs> So, um, I just like to know if you were watching a documentary. Well, I think what was a good, um, they talked about the different tactics that were used by tobacco companies and really hon honing in on these vulnerable communities. Um, and as you heard them say, that is just how a lot of people got you know, attention and notice with celebrities and so forth. And so they named different companies as far as the Thurgood Marshall Fund, which I remember I was very surprised when I saw this NAACP, just to name a few, um, but definitely have used many different tactics from even the price of the tobacco um, products are cheaper. Yeah, and giving and, them away for free. like we And saw giving them away from free to mm -hmm. concerts. Mm -hmm. and, and and I think what's was significant about this is that and what Lundy noticed it's menthol. Yeah. It's menthol, which is the hardest to quit. Mm -hmm. It's an addictive situation for um, the African American community. And so it's menthol. And that's what he noticed by looking at, okay, you know, um, biracial. And what I noticed is what my dad smoked versus what my mom's family smoked. Mm -hmm. And why is that? So mm -hmm. the, and what he learned that it was strategic in how the tobacco industry was purposefully targeting these communities. And that's the sad part about it. And so our first question, and you kind of touched on this, um, Dr. Tavoy, 
was, you know, to identify some of the tactics that were used. And I remember Jet Magazine. I mean, it was on the table of every Black family. And, you know, it was like the leading magazine besides Essence and Ebony. But even inside of those magazines, you still saw advertisements for cigarettes. You saw Black people smiling and having fun and, you know, on jet skis and boats, you know, like all this kind of thing, holding instruments. And the same things were in our community on billboards. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, I, I identify that as one of the tactics. And definitely making it appealing to the audience. I remember in one video or videos that we pretty much showed before is just, you know, you're having that image for us to connect to and making um, this image sell with these cigarettes and making it sexy, even with women targeting in the slim, the slim menthol cigarettes that was having and so forth. So um, they definitely made smoking appealing. It was the it thing at that time. Yeah. Yep, I agree. And it was almost like um, an oasis or taking you away from, you know, your reality and, you know, making it look provocative and new and exciting. And some of the facts that I wrote down were, you know, like uh -huh. in the beginning, um, 1953, their numbers weren't as the numbers of menthol smokers in, in the black community were low. But then by 1968, it had tripled, right? And then they took uh -huh. another figure from another year and then it tripled again. And then it's just like off the charts in the 2000s. That's what, uh -huh. you know, the, the figures say. So, you know, it was discovered very early, like after the world wars, what they said, the power of the black dollar. Yeah. It's still powerful today. Like if we stop shopping at, you know, certain stores, those those kinds of places will go out of business, you know. Um, it's just um, I don't know, it's amazing to to see how people, you know, zero in on the power of the black dollar. But what do you think about our community and what we know about the black dollar? I don't know if we realize or are aware the value of the black dollar Yeah. at this point. Um, I do know there has definitely been big movements to support um, our own businesses. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. There's been a huge movement for that, but I don't know if we understand the the power or the value of the black dollar. When we think about um, what I what I notice is that the one of the um, panelists that was discussing that this is a public health issue and definitely a social justice issue. Mm -hmm. And so when you start thinking about how many of these um, white companies basically targeted these vulnerable populations, again, this is all a part of systemic racism. That, that happens in targeting these communities and, and so forth. And so when you look at um, the stickers that they talked about posting everywhere and and we talk about the, the, the funds and, and it being lower and you talking about the money and so forth. So I don't, I, I think something that turned into a cool effect or even being it being used as a part of mental health, being used as a stressor. I think that many of us are not as educated or knowledgeable about, about what actually tobacco menthol particularly can actually do to us and do to our lungs. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Um, I, I kind of wrote down some of the, the topics that they were going over in order. And um, mm -hmm. the first part, of course, was about, you know, the source of the, the source of income. So it said um, they looked early on as to blacks as a source of income. They didn't care about their health. You know, they didn't care about their well-being or anything like that. And even in some of those documents that you hear that uh -huh. she worked in California, she she showed, she highlighted how it said, you know, they're poorly educated. There were two groups, you know, uh -huh. I think one was like the primary group and one was the secondary group. 
group and the secondary group was, you know, the educated ones, but they still wanted to target them. So um, it's just, <laughs> it's just interesting. Um, the predatory practices that still happen to this day. I think all of us knows someone, someone that smokes. So we talk a bit about the um, tactics that were used, right? Mm -hmm. And I think we also, you know, discussed that, um, you know, our level of surprise by the tax. I mean, it's been going on for so long that you just have to be, um, I don't know, I don't know if hope is the right kind of word to use for that, or you just have to be uh, observant um, when you see these kinds of things. But now it's just, it's just so mainstream. That, it is. that we kind of understand that those kind of tactics and things like that because we have these documentaries like this. Absolutely. I like the the last um, bullet that you have here. And I do know we have some people attendees. Feel free to, to raise yeah. your hand and discuss. But I think you're about to go to have you personally seen these tactics in use yourself. Um, I can't say necessarily that I have, I mean, I've seen the billboards. I think I've noticed more mm -hmm. upon this particular grant that we're doing and that we've been working on this project. Right. So I've definitely been more observant, but um, my family does not smoke. I didn't grow up around smokers. So therefore, I don't think I paid attention as much to these things. But what I will say, um, people that I have been around were friends or their family members who smoke. I, I did notice, I must agree, that everyone loves menthol, particularly Newports. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Particularly <laughs> Newports. So I did yeah. know that, notice yeah. that, or Virginia Slims. Mm -hmm. I saw a lot of females smoking Virginia Slims and they were menthol as well. Mm -hmm. And so that's where we are different, Dr. Savoy. Now, I grew up in a household where my father smoked Kent Golden Lights, and I had to go to the um, the liquor store, the the gas station, and purchase them for the dollar twenty five that he gave me. <laughs> so, yes, 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 I grew up in a household, and so I feel like that's why I have lots of allergies. So I was subjected to secondhand smoke, and this was before you had to roll the window down and you know all of that kind of stuff. So. Um, yeah, and not until I got older, like in my preteens or teenage years, that I realized that, oh, I probably shouldn't be, you know, smelling this stuff. So in the car, I'm rolling the window down, you know, <laughs> trying to, you know, get air into the car and stuff like that. So, yeah, I totally. So let me it. ask this question. Were you underage when you were purchasing the cigarettes for your father? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And so they never asked to see your ID or anything? No, ma'am. Yeah, I noticed that that was still happening in my research. One of the things, because Maryland has a higher rate of youth, um, youth being addicted to or smoking and being addicted to smoking and particularly menthol as well. And mm -hmm. so what they notice is that even though um, there has been a lot of policies that have been put in place, that there are still some re them stores that are allowing teens to go in there and purchase cigarettes. I'm sure because it's all about the money. It's not about you know, health or the law, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, it, it's about money. And so, yeah, this was in the 80s, you know, when I was younger, mm -hmm. you know, just walking around with friends and, you know, my dad's like, oh, you going to the store? Well, buy me some cigarettes, you know? <laughs> so, yeah, that happened. That definitely did. Um, anybody want to chime in on any of these? Were you surprised by any of the tactics? Um, would you like to identify some of the tactics that you saw uh, or your your personal experience? And I can't see the attendees, so that would be a Okay. Okay. Uh, the attendees do have the ability to unmute themselves. Okay. Thank you. And if not, that's okay. Okay. All right. So we have a um a question. So did you know that where you live, who you love? your race, your mental health, and financial status play an important role in how hard tobacco companies come after you. So yeah, we in with this statement, it feels like we're targeted, right? For who we are and what we do and how we live. So tobacco companies fund African-American organizations, 
Can you name some of the ones from the documentary that were accepting funds from tobacco companies? Does anybody remember? Yeah, I think I said um, Thurgood Marshall Fund. Um, mm -hmm. I think we looked at the Black Caucus was also one that was accepting funds. Mm -hmm. um, I truly believe the NAACP was accepting funds yeah, as well. Is, uh -huh. From, well, the, the documentary reported that they stopped. But yeah. um, there was reports of, you know, civil groups, religious groups, political groups, mm -hmm. you know, accepting. I wonder what religious groups are accepting. I am too. And I truly believe that, um, and, and in other research, we know that there are some colleges were accepting funds as well. Um, and, and again, they were bringing on concerts, bringing things within their university to assist them. Right. Well, you yeah. think about it, it's not many places that you don't see a cigarette, you know, banner. You know, like, I don't know if it's in the CQ arena or uh, or the Royal Farms arena or if it's in the, you know, like in the arenas now. But, you know, back in the day, there wasn't a place. It was it was commonplace to see, you know, like a cool's pack, you know, on a billboard or on a sign, you know, in a in a in a place. Uh, in a or staff. even in vending machines. Right. Remember those. You yes. Just, uh, yes. And I, as you were talking, I was thinking, I remember when my sister went to school and we we're we we're like 15 years apart, but they they could smoke mm -hmm. in her high school. They had an area where they could smoke. And I remember, I guess my mom probably made her take me to school sometimes when I would go. And I just remember seeing in the vending machines wow. that you could easily um, get cigarettes. Yeah. Remember, you could smoke in hospitals, on airplanes, in restaurants. Yeah. Now it's like, wow, you got to be out. They, we, they, you got to go outside. You can't do it in here. <laughs> yes. Good stuff. Well, this is the, the million dollar question, right? How can we change the narrative of how tobacco affects our community? What can we do? I think we have to to get involved. Definitely. Mm -hmm. I think we have to get involved. And I also believe in we have to educate our community. I think that's really key. Educate the community what tobacco industries are, 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 are purposefully, intentionally targeting vulnerable populations. And when we talk about vulnerable populations, it's not just African-American, mm -hmm. they're targeting Hispanics, they're targeting the LGBTQ, they're targeting women. So they are purposefully targeting these vulnerable communities to, for their agenda and for money right. purposes. So I do think it is about educating as well um, and even talking about what secondhand smoke does as well as what the hookahs, mm -hmm. jewels, cigarellos, yeah. the, the various types of um, tobaccos. Yeah. And at this point, even marijuana. Exactly. You know, vaping, some people say that, you know, in order to quit or a method to quit is to leave the menthol cigarettes and move to vaping. But, you know, mm -hmm. there are tons of facts on how dangerous vaping is because of, you know, this this kind of man made tobacco product. You don't know what's in it. And, you know, it's still tobacco. <laughs> and so you're inhaling it at a, at a higher rate, I guess, than, you know, a regular cigarette. And then and that's how much smoke comes out of the vape and out of the hookah and all of that kind of stuff stuff. And one of the facts that really sticks with me is that, you know, like one hour session, like a straight hour of hookah is like smoking so many cigarettes. I can't remember the exact fact. It's actually on our Instagram page that we'll show you. Um, but I was just floored and I was like, oh man. <laughs> yes absolutely and that became a crave so just think about all the hookah bars it was just like the thing to do and right. you're thinking oh it's just you know it's harmless it's right right and no no that was actually worse <laughs> so imagine if you did it for an hour every day and, you know, like the damage you could be causing to your lungs. And I mean, the tobacco is sweet and it's it's not like a harsh taste, like an actual cigarette. 
but you know it it is still damaging and that's the thing about it and so one of the things that we learned about and i'm going to talk about you know our grant a little bit later but one of the things we learned is that tobacco and nicotine and menthol are related mm -hmm. to mental health in a negative kind of derogatory kind of way with saying that you know in order to improve your mental health you should smoke a cigarette you should be mm -hmm. You should you you should um you know hookah or what have you and it will decrease your stress level and you know allow you to have you know um, mental health challenge but you're gaining an addiction <laughs> you know so yeah I think that's one of the things that that education will definitely solve okay I agree with you on on how to change the narrative is there anyone that would like to um, add to this. To how they think can change the narrative. We have some shy attendees. <laughs> okay. So, what do we do? You know, like you said, get involved, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's what this whole slide is about. Like, we need to advocate for our own change. If we don't fix it, nobody else will. It's kind of like other things in the black community. Like we have to recognize what's going on and we have to care enough to actually make that change. So what Dr. Savoy and I have done um, with the help of Dr. Murray and several of our task force members um, is we applied for and won a grant from Truth Initiative. And they actually do this every year with um, historically black colleges and universities across the country. And they, they uh, help us advocate for um, and they teach us how to adopt and implement a 100% smoke-free and tobacco-free campus policy. So what you see and what you have probably seen in your emails, um, you've probably seen this, this uh, logo here, but we are the Don't Cave In, so it's Copping Against Vaping and Tobacco Initiative. And so we won $20,000. Uh, and what we do is pretty much have fun educating the campus and we are rallying to enhance our current smoking policy. So look at us, yes, we are not targets, <laughs> but we are <laughs> project leads. So you can see us here at one of our um, events. It was a face-to-face -face event and um, we had a selfie, like little, the thing, the selfie frame that we're holding and we urged people to sign our petition or our pledge, sorry, um, supporting our efforts in making a smoke-free, a 100% smoke-free um, policy here at Coppin State University. So uh, we probably should have put in other pictures, but this is the one that we took and we had these little sticks that said that, you know, what what we were um, thankful for, grateful for, those kinds of things. Yeah. Or we could just, you know, kind of put whatever. People put all kinds of things like they were blessed and happy and loved and, you know, things mm -hmm. like that. We were, sh we were showcasing a different way to sh show emotions and feelings because this was also... Um, a mental health. We wanted to re remove the stigma um, mm -hmm. that you need to actually smoke or vape to help with any type of mental health issues. So we created a stress for your environment where we had music and we had selfies and we wanted to know what the students were feeling because this was actually the first semester that we were coming back on campus um, from the pandemic. And so the students had wrote different you know, feelings and so forth. And again, we could have put some more pictures on here, but Dr. Tatum and I did not even know what each other was writing. But when we showed up to take this picture, we both were feeling grateful. Yes, we, I don't <laughs> even know when you made yours. That was so funny. And we looked and we were like, ah! <laughs> yeah. Uh-oh, I lost it. What happened? Oh, no. I'm Oh, shoot. Okay. Something happened. That was weird. Okay, let me go back into um, presentation mode. My apologies. Okay, 
So I'll move on to the next one where so the grant has allowed us or it required us to work with students. This is actually supposed to be a student led initiative. Um, we had the opportunity to meet and interview um, at least 10 candidates, I believe. And um, here, here's the cream of the crop here. So these are our two college leaders. We have Kayleen Perez. She's a nursing major. I think she's Miss Junior, and she's like involved in every single everything. Royal everything. Court. <laughs> um, yes, she just got inducted into the nursing um, sorority. So she, she's an what ROTC. Yeah. She was also an advocate for our mental health. <laughs> so yes, yeah, she's in everything, and we adore her. But when she shows up to these events, she's just amazing. She does these videos and she posts them to our Instagram page, which you'll see. Um, and this is also Abigail Harrison. She's a health science major and she is our second college leader. So both of these young ladies have been instrumental in um, moving us forward thus far with this, this initiative. We also have a social media ambassador, and this is um, a jack of all trades. She's amazing. She she can do flyers. <laughs> she takes amazing pictures. Um, this is Genesis Scott, and she is a, a freshman. Yeah, she's a freshman. Yes, she and, is. Okay, and a criminal justice major. So um, here you see our Instagram. So please follow us on Instagram at kcab dot i n underscore c u for all kinds of updates uh, on what we're doing and later on we'll talk about all the fun stuff that we have coming up so uh the goal what we are trying to do is uh let everybody know and educate people um on what's going on it, with the tobacco industry as it relates to um black and brown and um, those vulnerable populations such as the LGBT community. Um, so we are committed to social justice and it is our goal to strengthen our existing tobacco policy by June of 2022. So yes, this party is coming to an end. We are actually um, drafting a, a policy to take to our various um, faculty senate, staff senate, and then we will um, bring it back to our task force, make any kind of adjustments that we need, and, um, and also SGA. We have to take it to the students as well, and then hopefully we can move forward um, as procedures allow to take it to, to the president for um, approval. So the current policy is here as well. Uh, it reads, Coppin State University is a smoke-free campus. Smoking is not prohibited in any facility. Students, employees, and visitors are prohibited from smoking tobacco, chewing smokeless tobacco, or any snuff in any existing building. Do you guys see any holes here? Anything missing here? Absolutely. It's not all inclusive. And so the last time this policy was updated was in 2012. And so there's some things that we probably definitely need to, need to put in here. And that is marijuana, which we found out is really big for us um, on the college campus. But not just that, I was speaking to Baltimore City Health Department. It seems to be a big issue among Baltimore City as well. Mm -hmm. So these things need to be included, especially now you have vape and jewels and hookahs, all these things that we didn't necessarily possibly have in 2012 or wasn't really looking at. And so this policy needs to be inclusive as well. Mm -hmm. And we also need to include things that might not have been invented yet, right? So we need some kind of inclusive language for, <laughs> you know, those kinds of products to come. So yes. So we have a survey to understand the um, the attitude, the pulse of the campus, what you have observed on campus. So if you wouldn't mind, take a quick um, snapshot of this, or um, we can pop the link into the chat if you have it, Dr. Savoy. And that way we can um, you know, gather your thoughts on smoking and tobacco on campus. Okay. Thank you. But one thing we want Big Tobacco to know is that we are not Target.
So as we come to the end of our presentation for this evening, we want to thank you for attending, but we would also like for you to know that we have several events coming up. So we have um, a cessation workshop uh, tomorrow, and um, there's information that we can pop in the chat for that, as well as links so that you can join. Um, we have in March and April, <laughs> where we have educational sessions. And then also in March, the students will be doing this interview session where they go around and just kind of random ask questions to um, other students on campus. So they call it Myrtle Street. Um, when March 26th, we will have a virtual faculty and staff town hall. So look for that information to come in your email as well, an invitation for that. Now, this is something that we are so excited about on campus. Have a don't cave in, ready, set, stop parade. So this is a united initiative with all of the organizations on campus. We're going to have visitors like Truth Initiative. We hope to work with the um, the found the Lung Foundation again. Um, the health department, whoever wants to come and support this initiative, will be able to do so. Um, we are. Uh, it's going to be a big grand event, so you do not want to miss this. And we will end our um, semester with a single de Mayo, don't cave in, I am not a target silent party. So if you were at the first silent party, you do not want to miss this one because you know you had a great time. Everybody was just kind of, you know, like, what are we doing? <laughs> and I remember that Dr. Murray, she was looking for us and she couldn't hear anything because all the music came through the earphones. So she was like, this is the quietest party. <laughs> so yes, but we had a great time. So. Thank you so much for joining us today. If you have any questions, we'll be happy to answer them. Thank you. The survey is also in the chat area as well. All right. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Please make sure you come out to our event. And if you haven't, join us on Instagram and follow us. Thank you. Hi, thank you. You all have a good night. You too. Thank you.